Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and today's video is an unfinished and repurposed video detailing this 10-year-old Holden Commodore SV6. To start with, I think it's important to place a little context as to what this video in detail actually is, as without it, this could be quite a confusing video. So I'll just get through that as quick as I can and then we'll move straight onto the video. Firstly, I filmed this car about 3-4 years ago and the reason I never edited or released it is because about halfway through the detail, the owner of this car abruptly needed it back for reasons I can't remember now, and I was obviously left with an unfinished detail and video. It's also worth mentioning that back then my video editing and filming skills weren't all that great or to my standards today, so I do apologise for the overall quality of the footage. Secondly, this car was actually in for some testing. So from time to time I get cars in, usually from family, friends or colleagues, where the goal is to test new or even unreleased prototype products and different methods and techniques, all based around gathering important information. So with these jobs, I get to test experiment on a non-customer car and the owner gets a free or at least heavily discounted detail in return. In general, the worse the car is, the better from a perspective of gathering information and this car was really trash so it made a great specimen. Thirdly, the question is, so why edit this video now? The truth is that I hurt my back about a week ago and I've been in no condition to work or film. And I've also been extremely bored and struggling to keep myself occupied. So editing this video is something more productive I could do without going against the doctor's advice. And lastly is the repurposing of this video footage. Initially, I was just going to do a podcast style video based around answering some questions I frequently get about certain detailing methods and techniques. But then I thought that having this footage to watch and sometimes reference could be a more engaging way of delivering this video. So in a nutshell, I'm going to use this unfinished detailing footage to share my thoughts on a few detailing products, methods and technique philosophies based around my own experience that will hopefully provide some helpful information. So for this one guys, I'm not going to focus too much on what I was using or doing specifically on this car, though I may be referencing it at times. What I am going to focus on here is answering some commonly asked questions and how you can hopefully become a better detailer by understanding and assessing products and techniques a little better, understanding there's pros and cons to everything we do and just being a little more honest and humble about detailing as a whole. So if that's your thing, I really hope you enjoy and find value in this video, but I also understand that it may not be a video for everyone. So as I start by giving the wheels a clean, I'm going to jump into a question I get a lot, which is about using pump action sprayers or foamers for wheel and even other cleaning chemicals. The main issue I've experienced with pump action sprayers is a lack of consistency with air, pressure, foam and liquid dispersing ratios. At first, the PSI is higher with better flow and more air coming through, but it quickly loses that pressure and then also starts changing the air to chemical ratio and overall consistency. With foaming sprayers, it's even more problematic as the foam goes from a nice, even consistency to a blotchy, spitting action and then a thick, drooling puddle. Now compare that to something like a pressure washer foam lance or a Tornador air tool, where the PSI and water or airflow is constantly regulated from start to finish and it's a completely different experience with a reliable flow from start to finish. It's also a lot of work pumping those sprayers up, Larger ones go for longer, but they require lots of hard pumping action, while smaller ones get up to pressure more quickly, but you're constantly repumping them every 15 to 30 seconds. So I'm not convinced that it's really any less labor intensive or always quicker than using a spray trigger, and especially a double action spray trigger, though at times they certainly can be. Another important point to mention is that chemicals aren't formulated by the brands to work with pump action sprayers. It's something you have to play with, experiment and solve, which in itself creates more work. I found that I had to mix certain chemicals at different ratios to my spray bottles or else the sprayers just kept on spitting and splattering and getting clogged and not all sprayers work the same with certain chemicals and that was a lot of work and testing to get those ratios right. 
In the end guys, I'm not at all opposed to pump action sprays and I do use them at times as they definitely have advantages like not having to squeeze triggers dozens of times over, hold larger volumes of liquids and being able to foam chemicals without the use of a pressure washer or air compressor. All I'm trying to point out here and in pretty much everything I'm going to be discussing is that there's pros and cons to everything in detailing and there's reasons why you or I may choose different ways of doing things with neither of us being necessarily right or wrong. We may just have different preferences and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Another largely asked question I get is should you pre-rinse wheels or car paint before applying detergents and other chemicals? So let's start by looking at the advantages of doing a pre-rinse and preferably a pressure washer rinse which is that it firstly removes a layer of looser dirt that your chemicals will no longer have to tackle or fight through allowing them to be more effective on the more stubborn grime. A pre-rinse also has the advantage of cooling the vehicle down in hotter weather and allowing your follow-up chemicals to dwell for much longer before drying or causing any streaks or staining issues. Water itself is also a mold solvent, so don't disregard its ability to start breaking down certain contamination. The longer the car or trim stay wet, the more time the water has the ability to aid the cleaning process. So those are all great advantages of performing an initial pre-rinse prior to using detergents or chemicals. So what are the disadvantages of doing a pre-rinse rather than just applying chemicals to dry unrinsed paint or trims? Firstly, in my experience, detergents and chemicals don't cling as well to wet paint as they do on dry paint, and as such, tend to run off more quickly and just don't dwell quite as good. Secondly, when you're applying something like an all-purpose cleaner at, let's say, a 1 to 5 ratio on wet paint, you're effectively further diluting it, meaning that that 1 to 5 ratio may become more like a 1 to 10 ratio on wet paint, but in any case, the concentration of all chemicals will be further reduced as they mix with the standing water. Thirdly, you're also adding an extra rinsing step that simply adds extra time and labour without conclusively knowing that there's a definite advantage either way. In my opinion and experience, there's as many cons to pre-rinsing as there is to not pre-rinsing that tends to cancel itself out. Now when working on hot outdoor environments there's an extra environmental factor that would lean towards doing a pre-rinse as it should cool the vehicle down, help prevent premature drying of the chemicals and also help avoid chemical staining or etchings. So you also need to adapt to specific conditions and make judgement calls on the fly. In the end I don't believe there's a right or wrong answer here, just be aware of the pros and cons and make your own informed decision. The next thing I wanted to discuss is different safe hand car washing methods, so let's take a look at a few different ones used today. The most popular one would be the two bucket wash method. With this method, you have two isolated buckets, one that contains clean, uncontaminated soapy water, while the second is purely clean water used for rinsing your wash pad and both buckets contain grit guards to further help isolate dirt particles. So the pros here is that you're able to rinse most of the dirt off your wash pad after each section and then fill the pad with clean soapy water from a separate bucket largely reducing dirt contamination which is obviously what leads to swirls. Another pro is that you only have one or two wash pads you need to clean and inspect during the process and that it's also a very clean, easy and convenient way to hand wash that doesn't take much longer or cost much more than an old school one bucket method and it's also easy to adapt to and absolutely works in being quite safe and effective. The cons of the two bucket method are that you do need to invest in buying and filling up an extra bucket and two grit guards and although having a separate bucket to rinse your wash pads out helps, it's certainly not going to 100% eliminate all the dirt re-entering the wash pad, so as with all the methods here, it's certainly not perfect. A second safe hand car washing method is the spray and rinse. So in this technique, you have your pre-mixed soap in a spray bottle, you spray it into a section, wet and dry your wash pad, hand wash the area, and then use a hose or pressure washer to rinse and repeat it over the rest of the vehicle. So the pros of this method is that you don't need any buckets or lots of wash pads and it's a very quick, cheap and minimalistic setup that's quite safe and effective. You're also not reintroducing your wash pad into dirty water and avoiding recontaminating it. 
The cons are that it can be wet, messy and a little awkward with the wash pad in one hand and running water in the other to rinse it out consistently. It's also fair to say that a pressure washer will be far more effective in thoroughly cleaning the wash pad out, but it's also a lot more messy and you need to step away from the vehicle as to not blow the dirt back onto the car. And as car wash soaps aren't formulated for spray bottle use, you also need to spend a little time working out good dilution ratios, which may be different for different car soaps. A third safe car washing technique is the multi-wash pad method. In this method, you basically use lots of clean wash pads, each one just cleaning one section or two with a single soapy water bucket, and then set the wash pads aside after each use. The pros of this method is that you never reuse each side of the wash pad more than once, largely avoiding any chance of dirt contamination or swirls. You only need one wash bucket and there's no need to rinse the wash pads out as you'll generally wash them all together at the end, potentially in a washing machine cycle. The cons are that you need about a dozen double-sided wash pads or potentially even more for larger vehicles. So it's a bigger initial investment and you obviously also need to clean all those wash pads after each wash. And unlike the other two previous methods that rely on cleaning and inspecting just one or two wash pads, you really have to make sure that a dozen plus wash pads are completely clean and free of any particles before each wash. It's also worth mentioning that you can certainly tweak and alter any one of these safe car washing methods to combine certain aspects and even introduce new ones like foaming your car and using that soap rather than a soapy wash bucket or a spray bottle. In the end guys, this is where I stand. I've used all these methods at times and continue to do so. In my experience and opinion, it's not as important as to which method you use as it is how well you use it. Every single one of these methods can be used with a bad, rushed and poor quality control technique, which will lead to bad results as they can all be used with good, methodical technique to render great and safe results. So just choose which one works best for you in your world and use it with a good technique as they all have pros and cons. Another big question I get is about using stronger traffic film, iron and tar removers pre or post hand wash. This is another not so straightforward answer. There's no doubt that using these stronger chemicals will remove more embedded grime to some degree pre hand wash, but there's also questions about when they are most effective, safe and if in fact they are always needed in a decontamination process. The thing about starting with the least aggressive wash and decontamination process and then working your way up is that you don't end up wasting time and money using certain products and methods that may not even be needed. So if a vehicle simply doesn't have tar deposits then you shouldn't need to use a tar remover just as if a vehicle doesn't have environmental fallout there's no benefit in using an iron remover. And the thing is that until you actually do a pre-wash, foam rinse and hand wash you simply can't make that call until that first layer of dirt is removed and you can actually inspect the vehicle for iron, tar and other strong traffic film contamination. The other thing is that using these chemicals over dirty car paint never allows them to work as effectively because there's a layer of looser dirt and grime between them and your chemicals. But once you remove that looser dirt with a pre-foam, rinse and hand wash, the chemicals can then be applied directly onto that more stubborn contamination and even wiped into the paint and trims to increase their effectiveness, which is something you certainly shouldn't do without first hand washing the vehicle. Safety in relation to swirls and scratches is another point to address. One argument I hear about doing traffic, iron and tar removal pre-wash treatments is that it makes the hand wash safer. 
The thing to understand about contamination like iron particles, tar deposits and strongly bonded traffic film is that it's rarely going to dislodge and scratch car paint during a hand wash. These are particles that need to be either dissolved or dislodged with iron and tar removers or automotive clay. It's looser dirt and grime that more easily comes off during a hand wash and that actually leads to swirls and not these stronger bonded particles. Is it possible? Anything's possible. But at best it's an exception and exceptions aren't the way to formulate standard processes. They are more so things we just need to adapt to in certain circumstances. Once again guys, I'm not at all opposed to using stronger pretreatments, especially if it's your car and you know for a fact that in your environment and in your experience with maintaining the vehicle, it works as a better overall process. I'm just trying to explain that there's reasons behind not always necessarily jumping straight to these stronger chemicals as a starting point, and that working up to them as needed can sometimes, though not always, be a good way to go. So let's talk a little about IPA or isopropyl alcohol panel wipes. Whether it's a branded, ready to use premix or you make your own, which is generally about one part of 100% isopropyl alcohol to four parts deionized water, IPA panel wipes are quite a unique detailing chemical in that they can clean and dry car paint and trims whilst being one of the only products that don't leave its own interfering residue behind. That's really the important factor here that they remove dust, dirt and residue from other detailing products that could potentially cause bonding issues with things like waxes, sealants and coatings as well as remove oils that could mask certain defects that would otherwise give us false readings or results in our progress. Now in saying that, IPA panel solutions can certainly cause issues of their own such as increasing the likelihood of wiping swirls and sometimes hazing car paint which is almost always directly related to using them on soft and sensitive car paints. Now, that I'd say on 80 to 90% of cars I work on, this is never an issue, but on that other 10 to 20% of more extremely soft paints, it can certainly be quite a frustrating issue to reintroduce swirls and haze after polishing the paint. So what's the solution? Simply not performing an IPA wipe will most likely lead to bonding issues if the polishing oils are left on the surface. But if you're not really fussed about a wax or sealant lasting as long as it possibly could, you can certainly just skip that process and just accept that you'll need to re-wax or reseal the car a little more frequently. The other option is to further dilute the IPA mix. So instead of a 1 to 4 ratio, you can use a 1 to 8 or even 1 to 10 ratio that should help reduce the likelihood of the alcohol marring the finish. A damp cloth with water on its own can also absolutely help clean polishing oils. But the issue is that it takes a lot of wiping to dry straight water off a panel. So water with even just 5 to 10% alcohol tends to be a better light cleaning and drying solution overall. Another great option for polishing those soft and sensitive paints is to use a primer polish that doesn't require an IPA wipe down, but it still leaves hardened and slicker resins behind that will significantly help reduce any wiping swirls or marring while still enabling paint protection products to bond to it quite effectively.
As I mentioned earlier, this car was in for testing purposes, so I was using some prototype compounds and polishes with dozens of different pads and comparing them with about a dozen different existing compounds to gather some helpful information. So I'm not going to go over all that testing as it was a long time ago and just too confusing to follow. But what I am going to discuss here is some paint correction processes and methods. So let's talk about a standard polishing set, which in most cases is working a half meter square section, doing about four overlapping row passes using moderate pressure and mid to high machine speeds with a slowish arm movement. Now, although we can certainly deviate from this basic paint correction technique, the question is, why do we even use this universal standard polishing method, at least as a baseline or benchmark process? The reason, which may be surprising to some, is not because it's necessarily a superior way of polishing, but more so because it's the easiest way of being consistent from one section to another, and that's really why car compounds are formulated the way they are, and why we tend to achieve better results following this basic polishing technique. There's lots of things happening when a machine, pad and compound hits car paint. Heat, friction, speed, pressure, time and movement, they get further influenced with surface variables, environment and user end factors, all of which make obtaining consistent results one of the hardest things to achieve. But in understanding all of that, you can certainly still achieve as good a result and potentially even better by working quite differently as long as you understand and know how to adapt that different technique successfully. So let me give you an example. Taking that basic paint correction technique I just described, keeping everything the same except for changing only two things. Firstly, doing eight row passes instead of four, and secondly, doubling your arm speed movement will, based on my own testing, render pretty much identical results. You can even go in the complete opposite direction and just do two row passes and halve the speed of your arm to a super slow arm movement to once again obtain very similar results. Why? Because you're still polishing for the exact amount of time with the same machine speed, same amount of pressure and within the same size section. All you're changing is the amount of passes you do but compensating for that by adjusting your arm speed. So then why do four passes instead of eight or two? It all comes back to consistency. It's pretty easy to keep count of three to four passes but when you start to get up to eight, 10 or 12 passes, you're going to lose count, especially as your mind wanders over the course of correcting an entire vehicle. So doing four passes is a better and easier way of being consistent. And on the opposite end, the issue with doing just two passes is that there's less forgiveness if your technique isn't perfect from edge to edge. While four passes allows you to rectify any issues, allowing for a more consistent result, even with a little more human error. But once you understand how to adjust, compensate and rectify certain things, there are circumstances where doing more or less passes can actually be beneficial to achieving a better result depending on the specific circumstances. So let's discuss another example to do with pressure. Now using more pressure tends to make compounds work faster but also break down more quickly and an additional side effect of this is increased heat and sometimes reduced finishing abilities. But once you understand that, you can in fact use increased pressure to your advantage to achieve certain objectives. One example of this is on a spot treatment area to deal with heavier isolated defects. You need to once again alter and understand how to safely and effectively execute this different technique. So in this instance, you'll increase and double your downward pressure and also use a very slow arm movement, but compensate for that by working a much smaller section and for much less time. This is how to increase cutting ability within isolated sections but without exhausting the compound or creating too much heat. I realize it may be difficult to comprehend exactly what I'm talking about here without the right sort of corresponding footage, but all I'm trying to point out is that we have and use standard paint correction techniques because for the most part they're a great place to start in any polishing process and without a doubt the best place for a newcomer to begin. It's always best to learn the rules and stick to them while you're still mastering a skill. But once you get over that hurdle, it's also important to start exploring those rules and tweaking them to your advantage so that you can progress further in this area of paint correction and understanding how changing one aspect affects another and how you can compensate for that is how you're going to master this skill.
So let's talk a little about this Holden Commodore SV6. This was a horrible paint to work on. Not to mention that it had many repainted panels which actually made it a fantastic car for testing purposes. I'm not sure if you were able to see it in the footage, but when I initially did an IPA wipe down on the bonnet, I had no issues. But when I went to do a second or final IPA wipe, it started swirling and hazing the paint in those sections. So what I ended up doing was what I just discussed earlier on, and that is further diluting my IPA solution with an additional 50% water, and that seemed to solve the problem for the final IPA wipe down after I corrected the whole panel. What I also found interesting is that this paint and most of the compounds I was testing all seem to favour wool pads, even though this was without a doubt a soft and sensitive paint. So whereas foam was finishing well, it just wasn't providing enough cut. And while microfiber was cutting well, it was just finishing horribly. But the wool pads seem to find a great balance of both cut and finishing abilities on this particular paint, and that's really not always the case when working on these more sensitive and softer paints. So this brings up without a doubt the single most important part of detailing, which is knowing how to assess your results and respond to them. And these are the questions you have to ask yourself. Number one, is it a safe result? Number two, is it an efficient result? And number three, is it an effective result? If you're able to answer yes to all three questions, fantastic and keep doing what you're doing. But if you answer no to any one of these three questions, you need to stop, assess and respond with a different approach. So let's look at question one, safety. If you're using, say, a cleaning chemical that's staining, hazing or etching a car surface, or you're removing exorbitant amounts of clear coat during a paint correction process, then no, it's not safe and you need to immediately stop, reassess and find a safer alternative. The same goes for question two, efficiency. It's fantastic if you're using a safe and effective method, but if you're spending half a day cleaning a steering wheel, it's obviously not an effective or appropriate way of proceeding so you need to find a better way to progress more efficiently. And lastly, with effectiveness, this is the whole reason we're detailing the car to start with. We're looking for a greatly improved result in our outcome. So working safely and efficiently means nothing if the end goal of producing a quality and effective finish isn't achieved. And this is the hard part. No one on earth can answer the question of what product tool or method you should use. Sure, we can give you suggestions and they may or may not work, and asking for help and advice can be a great lifeline at times, but it's only you with your own two hands and eyeballs in front of that cart that can for certain address and answer those questions based on your results. Every car, every paint, every trim, every defect is different. So inspect, assess, respond, evaluate. That's the only way you're truly going to solve the issues and get better at this trade.
So let's wrap up this video. Although I've discussed some of these points in past videos, it's honestly a hard thing to get into and concisely deliver in a video. So if some of this was a little hard to follow or understand, I apologize, but I gave it a go. I think the main point I was hoping to get across is that there's no such thing as the perfect product, tool, method, or technique. There's flaws in everything we use and how we use it. But the way we can all decide and discover what's best for each of us is through first-hand trial and error. To me, this is still by far the most valuable information we can obtain. There's this constant push with detailing to reaffirm and receive recognition that you are in fact using the best products and techniques, and those that don't are simply wrong. This unfortunately leads to some pretty petty online discussions and interactions where nothing positive is ever achieved. And the main goal seems to turn into getting the best of someone or winning a debate rather than actually sharing thoughts and experience that can benefit the larger detailing community. I know this isn't unique to detailing and I know I've gotten caught up in it in myself at times, but it's also important to recognize that this is not helpful in the least. Detailing is one of the smallest and most unregulated industries in the world, with very little substantial data to back up so many claims. Most of the information we have is either independent user end data or information provided by detailing product manufacturers and brands selling these products, which is potentially sensationalized information, but at best it's really all anecdotal data with very little proven results that could be considered fact. In other words, we know very little to be certain when it comes to car detailing products and techniques, and perhaps accept a little too much at face value to be true when in fact we just don't know. I think there should be a humbling point and revelation that makes us all take a step back and realize that we're all still students within this trade and craft with so much more to learn. I think I'll leave it there guys, and if you enjoyed this video and would like to say thanks and help support future content, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash ccad in which I'll have a link to in the description box and thank you everyone for the support so far. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please share it with others, give it a like and comment below to show your support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.
altitude station. Blue light construction. Measure with blue light door button. On the third street exit. 